I welcome you to another one of our continuing conversations on the challenges facing New York City at this difficult time, the role of local government, and what all of us can do to fight back. And tonight we'll be focusing on the second wave of the COVID pandemic, which has now hit New York City, what comes next, what it means for all of us, and what we can do to fight back. I'm thrilled that we are joined this evening by the still fairly new commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Dave Chopsky. And I think he's just getting on, so we'll give him a moment to get uh, the link set up. And we're also going to be joined tonight by Dr. Ted Long, who is the executive director of the New York City Test and Trace Corps. And I'm very excited to get to as many of your questions as possible. Eh, ustedes saben que tiramos siempre un chin de español, así que mi nombre es Mark Levin, concejal del Distrito 7 acá en el norte de Manhattan y presidente del Comité de Salud del Consejo Municipal. Bienvenidos a otra en esta serie de conversaciones acerca de los retos principales que enfrentamos acá en Nueva York. Hoy se trata de la segunda ola del COVID. Con ustedes en unos breves momentos, el comisionado del Departamento de Salud, Dr. Dave Chachki. Eh, ustedes quizás no lo saben, pero él habla español bastante bien. Así que vamos a ver si, si esto lo hacemos bilingüe. Um, thank you again for joining us. And I see we have Commissioner Dave Chachki with, with us. That's great. And I understand that Dr. Long will be joining us momentarily. Uh, welcome. Welcome, Commissioner. Um, thank you, Council Member Levine. Thank you so much for, um, for having me. Uh, at such an important moment uh, for our city. I'm very grateful for the chance to, um, to speak with all of you tonight. Thank you. Well, we have enormous interest in this session tonight because I think we understand this is a difficult moment in our battle against this pandemic, a battle we would all love to be done with, but unfortunately we're not because the second wave is here. And we're gonna get to as many of your questions to all of you who are with us on Zoom or Facebook as we can. We only have an hour, so we're going to try and make this quick. Uh, we'll try and keep our responses uh, concise. I'll try and lead by example, um, but we do want this to be interactive. So you can use our chat feature to put your questions in. If you're with us on Facebook, we're monitoring that as well. And I do understand that, Commissioner, you might have um, a very, very short uh, presentation for us. And perhaps, perhaps this big picture question is covered in your presentation, but if not, I'll just throw it out to get started. Where are we? Um, how quickly uh, is this virus growing in New York City? How, con how concerned should we be? And uh, with that opening question, I wanna welcome you again, and I'll now pass it off to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, well, thank you again. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity um, and yes, let me start with your question. And I want to be as uh, straightforward, um, you know, as possible uh, at this uh, challenging moment for our city. Uh, and it's challenging because what we are seeing is that uh, the right. number of cases in New York City uh, has grown significantly. Um, it has uh, it has doubled uh, over uh, the the month from October to November. But then in the last two weeks, it has doubled again. So what we're seeing is an acceleration in the number of cases in New York City. What we know, um, both from our own experience, as well as from looking around the country and around the world, is that that increase in cases, unless we take action um, you know, very uh, quickly, turns into an increase in hospitalizations and most tragically into severe illness and, and deaths of our fellow New Yorkers. So. What I'm feeling um, most of all right now is uh, a profound sense of urgency uh, for all of us as New Yorkers to do the things that we need to do to interrupt the spread, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, but then also, you know, for us to make sure that as a city, we're taking the right actions as well. Thank you. And we, we are joined now also by Dr. Ted Long. And, and Ted, we had introduced you earlier, but uh, of course, Dr. Long is the executive director of the Test and Trace Corps, um, which is overseeing the testing program in the city and contact tracing uh, and a variety of supportive services, um, which we can talk about tonight, uh, whether it's quarantining or isolating. Um, so we're very happy to have you here as well, Dr. Long. 
And um, Commissioner or, or Ted, did you all have a, a short um, a deck you wanted to quickly run through? Um, yes, I believe my staff has a few slides. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, perfect. I, uh, here they are. And, and we'll do this um, as, as you uh, had suggested, uh, Council Member Levine, you know, very quickly, uh, just so we can get to the questions that, Thank you. that all of you have. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can go to the next slide. This is just to um, reinforce the point. You can see, you know, on the left hand side, uh, our cases uh, as they're growing over time. And on the right hand side, uh, the percent positivity by zip code. Uh, let me just make two points here. The first is that um, our cases continue to grow at too rapid of a pace. Uh, we surpassed 1,200 uh, cases just in the last 24 hours um, you know, that's been reported uh, citywide. Remember, we had been at about 200 to 300 cases for much of the summer through August. Uh, and so uh, that is very you know, concerning with respect to that, uh, that rapid increase that we're seeing. And then on the right hand side, uh, you know, we went through uh, some phases over the last few months with respect to seeing specific areas like Sunset Park or uh, Tremont or, uh, you know, parts of Queens where we did see upticks um, that then uh, changed into, you know, slightly larger areas, which you may remember we described as the Brooklyn and Queens clusters. Uh, both of those we were able to get under control, you know, thanks to our uh, what we call hyper-local efforts. But unfortunately, what we're seeing now on the right-hand side with the map is that uh, there are multiple parts of the city involved. And so we both have to think about specific communities and neighborhoods, but also what we need to do uh, as an entire city. Next slide. Um, and so I, I wanna make sure, you know, we, we provide uh, the best guidance that we possibly can. Um, you know, all of the data in the world isn't helpful until we translate it into action. One of the things that I'm really concerned about uh, in the coming weeks is, uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, as we um, try to celebrate the holidays and particularly after such a difficult year that all of us, you know, have experienced, um, that there may be actually a further increase in cases because of, of people gathering or people traveling. Uh, and so our guidance, uh, as difficult as this is to recommend, um, is really to advise against that. What we're finding out, particularly, you know, in recent weeks, is that in addition to, you know, higher risk settings that we know um, create uh, the spread of, of COVID-19, particularly places where people are indoors and not wearing their masks regularly, um, in addition to what you might think of, you know, with respect to restaurants or gyms or other places like that, we're seeing a lot of spread in smaller social gatherings as well. You know, birthday parties, uh, people just gathering, you know, for the big game, uh, and certainly, you know, sharing a meal over Thanksgiving would be part of that as well. So um, again, you know, as tough as it is to, uh, to make these recommendations, and we don't do it lightly, um, we believe that things would get significantly worse if we see people gathering or uh, undertaking holiday travel. So that's, that's our holiday guidance. Next slide. Um, and then you see a little bit more with respect to, you know, the specifics around our holiday guidance. I'll just skip to the next slide in the interest of time. Um, and you've heard this, you know, with respect to our um, public health guidance uh, over the last few months. We call this, uh, you know, the five actions that you can take. Um, but we can't say it enough because it's about uh, remaining disciplined and remaining vigilant with respect to these actions. Um, look, I, I want to just acknowledge all of us are so tired of the pandemic. You know, COVID fatigue is a very real thing but we can't let COVID fatigue turn into compassion fatigue. Um, and that's what I worry about. Uh, you know, both Dr. Long and I took care of patients in March and April. Um, we saw just how much suffering there was among our fellow New Yorkers. All of you, I'm sure, if you haven't, um, you know, uh, grappled with COVID yourself or for a family member, all of us know someone who has been profoundly affected by this devastating virus. And so we wanna make sure that we are um, you know, sounding the alarm at this moment to say, 
this is the time to double down, um, to try to prevent what we experienced back in March and April, as well as what too many people around the country and around the world are experiencing at this moment. So these five actions are what we recommend. Very important to stay home if you're sick, um, you know, to wear a face covering and you'll start to see our public service announcements about this, you know, as the weather turns colder um, and the air becomes drier, it actually makes a virus like COVID-19 uh, easier to spread. So it becomes very important to make sure that you're wearing a, a mask or a face covering both indoors and outdoors. Keep your physical distance, you know, six feet may be uh, what separates us from a much worse uh, second wave here. Keep your hands clean, you know, wash them. Soap and water for 20 seconds is best, but hand sanitizer if you don't have that. And then as Dr. Long will, will talk a little bit more about, get tested. Our recommendation in New York City is for everyone uh, to get tested, um, to do it with some frequency, particularly if you're at higher risk for exposure. And we're gonna do everything that we can to help people get, uh, get tested uh, quickly and get their test results back rapidly. So let me just wrap up uh, by saying again, you know, I am, um, as the city's doctor, my uh, primary job is to try to save lives and prevent suffering. And I hope you can hear the worry in my voice as we see these indicators move in the wrong direction. But I also wanna make sure uh, to convey that we can take the steps that we need to, to try to prevent some of what we see unfolding uh, around the rest of the country. And so we'll do everything in our power to enable that, but we're also asking each of you um, to take the right steps. What we have to do is make it so that positive behaviors are more contagious than the virus itself. So thank you again for allowing me to- Thank you, Commissioner, for that, um, for that excellent overview. We've had a number of questions from folks about where they can see some of the data in detail. And I have to say that the Department of Health has really an outstanding website with updated data um, in great detail, uh, much of it updated daily. And perhaps um, Commissioner or Dr. Long, someone on your teams could drop that link into the chat. Uh, and you know, I'm not afraid to, to call out when I think the city is not doing something right on COVID, but I have to say, I think we have the most transparent reporting on COVID of, of any place in America. And uh, I know the department's worked very hard on that. We've had a, a number of questions in the chat already um, about Uptown Manhattan. Uh, one here from uh, Clara Galvano. And it turns out that the five zip codes that comprise uh, West Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood, which would be uh, 10031, 32, 33, 40, and 34, um, are, uh, are, are really, I think, experiencing some of the highest levels in Manhattan. Collectively, this is um, the highest level of infection in Manhattan. Uh, they're all close to 4% now over the last seven days for positivity. And I believe that 10040, which is Northern Washington Heights, is, is uh, close to 5% at this point. And um, I wonder if you could explain uh, why you think that might be, um, what could be some unique challenges in this part of Manhattan? Mm -hmm. Oh, Council Member Levine, this is Ted. Um, can I answer that and maybe weave please, in a couple of introductory please. remarks too? Um, yes. So I just wanted to say, first off, thank you for everybody's time. Um, I, and I'm sorry, I was a couple of minutes late. No uh, I come at this from the perspective, I'm a primary care doctor and so, so is uh, Commissioner Trokshi. Um, And I remember back in March and April, um, I've continued to see my patients throughout the crisis, and I spent a lot of time in our front lines. And I remember, for example, going to Lincoln Hospital, where we had quadrupled, not tripled, quadrupled the number of ICU beds that we needed to save people in the Bronx. And I, I will never forget the visual images of everything I saw when I was on, on those front lines. We will not go back there. We cannot go back there. Um, I want to tell you what we're doing now and what, what our status is from my perspective, but if you take one thing away from me, throughout our hour together, it is this, get tested. And I'm gonna to try to convince you why. So what separates us from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, to give you a perspective, New York City, if you were to make a scenario of the worst possible place for coronavirus, or we live packed together in close proximity, we have a major international airport, 
you think of New York City, we have the hardest time of any place in the world in terms of the setup that we have combating the coronavirus. Yet, if you look at our numbers, they are rising. Uh, Commissioner Chuck and I are very concerned about this, but they're lower than almost everywhere else in the country. And why is that? It's for three reasons. Number one, New Yorkers are wearing masks. You're all making little sacrifices every time you leave your house, your apartment. That's what we need to keep doing. Number two, when we call you, you're picking up the phone. Our contact tracing numbers were completed in interviews with almost 80% of every case in New York City and 98% of them confirmed for us every single day they're staying at home. That cuts the chance of transmission. And number three, you're going out there and getting tested. Let me give you something to be proud of. If you look across the world, compare New York City, the rate at which we're doing testing per capita for New Yorkers compared to other countries, we're actually, I believe, number three or number four in the whole world. The only countries that surpass us now are Luxembourg, Lithuania, and I think Denmark might have been up there. Um, but we're doing better than Asian countries like South Korea, European countries like Germany, the United Kingdom. And it's because of you. You're going out there and you're getting tested and you're giving us the information we need to help people to know who, if you have the virus, to stay at home, you, who you could have infected, and to have them stay at home too. The effect of all of that is that New York City, which is a setup for having the hardest time, is actually doing one of the best in terms of big cities in the country. But we're in a precarious situation now, and this is where everywhere across New York City, everywhere that you live, we need to, as, doc, as Dr. Chokshi said, double our efforts. We're doing better, but the numbers are steadily rising. This is the moment where we can continue to have more control or it can really get out of control. And my plea to you is please keep wearing your mask and come out and get tested. Um, I saw in the chat box a minute ago in terms of your specific communities, um, there, there was a comment that made around the lines, the wait times. Um, I will tell you, I checked today. Um, we have more than 50 sites, um, locations today in New York City Health and Hospitals where we're doing testing. I checked across our sites. We have in, um, in Harlem, we have Harlem Hospital. Um, we have you know, Sidenham Community Health Center. We have a variety of other sites. Less than 30 minute wait times at all of the sites I checked today in your communities. Um, so I'm just going to interrupt because this, this is very, this is very important. And there's been a lot of frustration with the long lines at City MD. And I think that people go to City MD because they're visible on the street and people are used to going there. But what you're telling us is important. There are places you can go for a short, a much shorter wait time. And they're also offering um, a, a high quality test, the PCR. Um, and is that correct at the H and H sites? And not just that. If you come to one of our sites here, I may give you my pitch if you'll allow me. Right. This is the most important thing you're going to take away from me, as Council Member Levine is saying. If you get tested, it enables us to do our contact tracing, to offer you resources. We'll give you free food. We'll walk your dog for free. We'll drive you for free to a free hotel. We'll do everything in our power to help you. But we can't do anything I just said if you don't get tested in the first place. Right. You come to one of our sites, less than 30 minute wait at our hospitals and at our community health centers today. Um, at our sites, you will do the anterior nary swab, which is the one that's you know quick, painless, just takes a matter of seconds, no more nasopharyngeal swab. And if there happens to be a line at any of our sites, we walk up and down that line and offer you a kit to do the swab yourself. So you could say, hey, there's a 30 minute line here. Okay, I'm just gonna do the swab myself, be on my way, we'll call you with the results. We wanna do everything to make this as easy, fast and pain-free as possible. And at all of our sites, it is always free. So please and come visit us. And someone just posted very help helpfully that at Dykeman and Nagel, where there's a very well-known site um, uh, run by Health and Hospitals, the wait uh, looks like it's 20 minutes mm -hmm. uh, and results uh, in 24 hours. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and Brett Dakin's posting that at the old Broadway site. It's another well-known site in West Harlem. Apparently there's no wait. Um, now you're you. also offering some super fast turnaround clinics. Uh, this would be uh, commissioner uh, under your auspices. Um, you have one on 100th Street uh, between Columbus and Amsterdam, which you call your Riverside Clinic, and one um, next to uh, the hospital. Uh, I believe the address is 500 West 168th. Um, someone can perhaps confirm that. But these are, are both extremely high quality kind of gold standard PCR tests. And, and I understand you're getting turnaround often in, in as little as, as an hour or two. Um, 
those are by appointment only, correct? That's all um, correct, yes. Yeah, the, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this as well. These are um, our, our COVID Express sites. Um, I'll say I got tested myself at the Riverside uh, site uh, just you know a few days ago. And, um, and you're exactly right. Generally, you know, results come back within uh, two or three hours. We guarantee it back within 24 hours. Um, someone can put the link uh, into, uh, into the chat box as well. It's by appointment only. If you find that there are no appointments available, then I wanna make sure you know what Dr. Long said. There are plenty of other sites uh, to go to. If you go to nyc.gov slash COVID test, um, that's the, the locator. One other thing about our COVID Express sites is that you can also get your flu vaccine there. And if I may, this is the checklist that I'm giving you know, to, to all New Yorkers, not just what we talked about in terms of the core four uh, to prevent the spread uh, of the coronavirus, but also get tested and get your flu shot. These are all things that we can do to protect ourselves as well as to protect our fellow New Yorkers. And what is the current guidance on how often someone should get tested? Obviously, if you're symptomatic, you go immediately. But if someone uh, is not symptomatic, how often should they get tested? That's right. Let me start. And then, uh, and then I'm sure Dr. Long can add in. Uh, the most important thing is that if you are symptomatic, you should go urgently to get tested. That will help uh, protect you. And it also helps protect uh, everyone around you, including your family members. Um, then if you believe you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19, um, you know, particularly if you've been in close proximity with them for more than 10 minutes, if for whatever reason, you know, uh, either you or that person were not wearing a mask, um, then that's also an urgent reason to get tested as quickly as possible. For everyone else, we also recommend that you get uh, tested, um, you know, and the frequency of doing that uh, depends a little bit on your risk. If you're an essential worker and you're inter interacting with the public on a regular basis, uh, you should get tested at least monthly. Uh, and for everyone else, it's reasonable to get tested monthly, um, but certainly every two to three months for, uh, for all New Yorkers. And that's you know, particularly important right now as we see cases increase and community transmission uh, go up as well. We've had a number of questions about um discrepancy between the data that uh, the New York City Health Department reports and the data that the State Health Department reports. Uh, Could you give us kind of a, a, a brief layman's read on why there is a discrepancy? Sure, and you know, let me acknowledge that I, I understand the frustration about this, you know, in terms of uh, trying to coordinate with respect to uh, the data that we report, that, that the state reports, and then the actions, you know, that are taken as a result of that data. So we're, we're continually, you know, working with our state counterparts to figure out how, um, how we can bring everything in as close alignment as possible. Uh, with that said, we uh, are committed, you know, as uh, the city's leaders to give the best possible uh, visibility into what's happening with the virus in New York City. Um, we have uh, such a stellar team here at the health department, um, epidemiologists who have decades of experience in uh, tracking diseases, not just uh, COVID-19, but you know, other diseases as well. We have brought to bear all of that um, you know, with respect to how we're thinking about fighting this virus. And so the way that we look uh, at our data is really laser focused on making sure that we can identify trends over time. And so that's one of the big differences between our uh, way of measuring test positivity and the way that the state uh, is looking at it. Um, and we want to do it in a way that is sensitive, that allows us to be able to jump on trends as soon as they occur so that we can make the case for action, again, both at the citywide level, but, um, but that uh, uh, what each of us as individuals can do um, as well. So, uh, you know, and as you pointed out, Councilmember Levine, you know, we have all of this data up on our website. The link went into the chat box so you can peruse it yourself. We refresh it on a daily basis now, including that neighborhood level, that zip code level data, so you can see exactly what's happening in your own uh, community. And so we're going to continue to strive to make it as good and as rigorous and as updated as possible, um, but that's the simple explanation. Mm -hmm.
It seems that a lot of folks are already fans of your rapid testing facilities, so much so that they're having a hard time getting appointments. Uh, and I know that you have some constraints on uh, on reagents and other uh, supplies um, that limit how many tests you can run a day. Um, is there uh, a possibility of expanding um, those resources to add uh, appointment slots? So we I'll, are. Dave. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, Ted, and then pass the baton to you. Yes, um, we are. You know, working as as much as we can to be able to expand uh, the timing for uh, those test sites. Um, but I, I want to make sure the key message is: if you want to get a test uh, and you want to get a rapid turnaround for it, we have plenty of options. And it's Dr. Long's team that has really helped us expand that capacity across the entire city. So um, please, Dr. Long, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just wanna make the point. I mean, our goal here is to make it as easy for you to get tested as possible. Uh, the website I put into the chat, it's nyc.gov backslash COVID test, um, as Dave said. And then if you call 212 COVID-19, easy to remember, 212 COVID-19, on the phone, you can be directed uh, to the site nearest to you. So again, we wanna make this as easy as possible. For our rapid testing, the way that works is that some of our sites if we, we have the rapid testing machines where you do the test, you get your result back within 15 minutes. A reason to do that, and at our health and hospital sites, they're all walk-in, they're not appointment-based. Um, if you walk in, get your rapid testing result and it's positive, which you'll know within 15 minutes, we have a team of in-person contact tracers at those sites where we do contact tracing instantaneously. And then if you've exposed anybody else during your infectious period, We'll call them that day and offer to bring them in for testing immediately. So it's a great way to really squeeze down on the virus because we don't miss a beat. We have your result back in 15 minutes. We're on the phone with anybody that you could have exposed literally that day to have them come in for testing themselves. Also, before you leave, we're going to pair you up with the resource navigator. Um, so if you're positive, you won't leave without us talking to you about free food delivery, free hotel stay, again, with free transport to the hotel and free pajamas when you walk through the door and free things like us walking your dog for you or telehealth. So we really wanna make this as easy and feasible for you to get through this period if you are um, potentially positive as possible. Um, also, just to wanna note, I um, hopefully council member Levine will not be upset with me. Um, I was asked to include my personal email in the chat box, which I did. So it's ted.long at nychc.org and I will forward all emails to council member Levine. Uh, no, no, no. They'll be bouncing right back to you, <laughs> Ted. Um, uh, you have mentioned a couple of times, I think, the most important and probably um, least well-known service that we're offering now to help keep people safe, which is isolation at hotels. And for us uptown, where we almost all live in um, very small apartments with, with uh, multiple members of the household, um, you know, when one person gets sick, it is really hard to protect the rest of the family. And, you know, I know all the rules and I adhere to everything and I got COVID in the spring and unfortunately the rest of my family did too. We're all fine, thank goodness. But it just goes to show you how tough it is in a small apartment. Um, and so the city offering a free hotel to isolate is a really big deal. And they will make it so you don't have to leave the room. They will provide food and uh, prescription services and laundry services. And there's some mm -hmm. limited medical staff in the building. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess Dr. Long, if, if someone tests positive, they'll have a contact tracer call. But is it fair to say that if someone believes they need this service, that they can call the COVID hotline, which I guess is just 212 COVID-19, uh, is that the right phone number? Yeah, what? and okay. you're absolutely right, council member. So just to walk you through, if you have a positive test, you're going to get called by one of our contact tracers and they're going to ask you if you need any of these services and then they'll connect you directly. Or um, if for whatever reason you decide later you want the services between phone calls or anything like that, you can always call 212 COVID-19 and we'll arrange for you to be brought to our hotel. Again, we'll bring you there for free, the stay there is free and everything that council member Levine said is also free there. And we actually have a decent amount of medical services in the hotels too, just to make sure everybody's safe. So we really wanna give you a high quality experience. That's great. We have a question and, and I won't repeat the name because I don't wanna give out personal details, but it looks like someone who uh, for, for medical concerns is not comfortable leaving their apartment. Is there, a, is there any home-based testing opportunity that for someone who really just is not comfortable leaving their home? 
Yes, there is. So um, a couple of things. So one is um, we have self-test kits that, by the way, if you're a contact now, um, we're mailing every single contact to people that have been exposed a kit to get tested uh, uh, by themselves at home. So you can get tested now without having to leave your home. And we're even we're mailing you the kit ahead of time um, to make sure we make it as easy as possible to get everybody tested. Um, if you can't come to one of our sites because you're homebound and you want to know your status, you can call the hotline um, or you can reach out to me or my team. And we do have mechanisms to be able to do home testing, which we'd be happy to do. That's great news. Um, we, we have a number of questions about um, just what defines a close contact, uh, I guess, for purposes, for purposes of contact tracing or just one being concerned about exposure. And Elizabeth Norton, who I guess is a business owner, is asking, um, is it 15 minutes in close range? Is it 10 minutes? Does wearing a mask impact it either way? Um, for someone running a service business, obviously, those are important considerations. Mm -hmm. I'll start and then I'll turn to, um, to Dave. So uh, for contact tracing, and this is built into our scripts, um, the definition is less than six feet for 10 minutes. So if you're um, in close proximity to somebody with, in less, with uh, less than six feet for more than 10 minutes, you're considered a close contact. Um, and then as a close contact, just to really agree with it, what Council Member Levine was saying, you also get all of these services I'm talking about, including a self-test kit mailed to your doorstep. Okay, that, that's excellent. Um, there seems to be some pet lovers on the chat. So I just want to clarify something you said earlier. And if, uh, if someone has a pet or an animal at home, and for example, they need to quarantine, uh, they shouldn't be out walking the dog, right? Because quarantining means stay home unless you have a medical necessity like an appointment or some other purpose. So uh, did you say, and can you clarify, you have a solution for people who need pet care during quarantine or isolation? Yes, uh, I was actually very serious. Um, it's with an organization called WAG, W-A-G exclamation point is their formal title. Um, and uh, we, do, we will arrange for free to have somebody come to your apartment or house um, and walk your dog for you because you're right, council member, it is important and I know it's hard, um, but even walking your dog means you're outside and potentially risking interacting with others. So yes, we will for free walk your dog. Excellent, so we, we have a number of questions about restaurants and dining, indoor and outdoor. And um, my concerns on this are, are well articulated. Uh, I'm extremely worried about indoor dining as being too risky now because of, of the rebound of the virus in New York City. And, um, and I, I've said quite clearly that I think um, there's much more risk in indoor dining and frankly gyms than there is in schools and that that should have been the priority for what we would uh, close first. Uh, I, I, I won't put you on the spot on that policy question although if you wanna weigh in, weigh in, I welcome you to, I understand these decisions are made potentially at the level of city hall or even by the governor. Um, but I do, I do have a concern on outdoor dining as well, which is some of these enclosures are becoming so all encompassing that they're really recreating uh, an indoor dining uh, venue uh, with all the risk associated with that. So um, is there no enforcement by the city um, and uh, I guess if you want to weigh in on how people should think about indoor dining from, from you know, a, a medical perspective, I'd welcome uh, your thoughts on that too. Yes, I'm happy to. And uh, look, Council Member Levine, I, I share your uh, concerns. Um, we know, you know from, uh, from the evidence, uh, from experience around the country and around the world that, um, that dining is uh, one of the riskier activities for the reason that I mentioned uh, before. It's indoors and when you're eating and drinking, you know, you don't wear your mask consistently. So um, those are things that, you know, that elevate the risk associated with it. Um, the mayor has said before that once we hit, you know, 2% test positivity, we really needed to reassess uh, indoor dining in New York City. Um, I know that he's had uh, conversations with the governor about it. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it's a decision that, um, that New York State has to 
undertake as the regulator for, uh, you know, for dining, including in New York City. Um, but, you know, I, I want to emphasize there are, as we're awaiting for, you know, those policy conversations and those decisions to, uh, to unfold, there are things that we can do today with respect to mitigating risk. Um, and there are some actions that we take uh, as a city, uh, particularly around, you know, the enforcement around outdoor dining that you mentioned. You know, I know there are many of my colleagues in law enforcement who uh, have also looked at the, the outdoor dining structures, you know, with concern, uh, particularly our Demar Department of Buildings uh, colleagues. Um, so if it's a three-sided enclosure or a four-sided enclosure, you know, without sufficient ventilation, again, that's a riskier place. Uh, we know that from the scientific perspective. And, and the rule commissioner is only 50% of the sides are, should be enclosed, correct? That's exactly right. It right. should be only, you know, two sides according to, uh, according to the state's uh, rules on this. Um, and so, you know, that is something that is, is being undertaken uh, by the city. If it is a fully enclosed dining structure, meaning four sides, but it's just outdoors, um, then that has to adhere to the indoor dining occupancy restrictions, which is right now at 25%. And then the final thing that I'll say is that, you know, all of us uh, have the chance to take uh, some of this into our own hands. And, you know, particularly if you are someone who is uh, medically more vulnerable or you live with or interact with someone, you know, who uh, may be at risk, uh, then these are things to take into consideration as you go about um, all of your daily activities. So all to say, I share the concern. We, we have uh, you know, ensured that it is prioritized in the policy conversation. And, um, and I do think that we'll see uh, some, some action taken by the state in coming days. I, I hope so. And, and I'll just say that just because uh, indoor dining is, is allowed doesn't mean that you have to partake in it every night. Uh, really think about your safety. And I understand that what we're talking about here could mean real dire economic consequences for small businesses, um, for restaurants which are hanging on a thread already, and that if we pause indoor dining, that'll be yet another blow. And uh, I'm adamant that we need financial assistance for those businesses. It should be the federal government. It might be the federal government, but uh, I think the city and state need to find some way to help with financial aid to these struggling businesses. But you know, our choice is, is either to take targeted action now or face much more serious options in a couple of weeks. And no one wants to have to do a full shutdown again. No one wants that. And the way to avoid that, in my opinion, is more targeted actions now. Um, we do have a number of questions about travel. Obviously Thanksgiving's next week and um, you know, I, I have heard from a lot of people who are getting tests that what their plan is, is to get a negative and, um, and then go uh, to a family gathering. Uh, I wonder if you could address that, the prudence of that um, as a strategy. Sure, uh, why don't I start, um, and Dr. Long, please add in. Uh, you know, our, our recommendation is to be very, um, very clear about what is the lowest risk uh, over the holidays, uh, which is to rediscover holidays at home, you know, to, uh, to celebrate with your immediate family members, you know, within your own household. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I recognize what a sacrifice that represents, um, particularly during such a challenging year for all of us. Um, that's what I will be doing, uh, you know, myself uh, with my own family. Um, I have a I have a baby daughter uh, at home who hasn't seen uh, her grandparents, you know, my parents in over a year, and um, we had really looked forward to celebrating the holidays uh, with them. Um, and so it's a it's a really tough thing, you know, for us all to confront. With respect to the question about testing. Um, if this is done in a very, very rigorous way, it provides uh, some safety, but I want to be clear, it's not as safe as avoiding the gathering uh, in the first place. So, um, you know, there is uh, the, the option if you um, absolutely cannot avoid travel uh, to ensure that you get tested, you know, three days before you travel 
to be in a strict quarantine after that, meaning no exposure, um, then to be, you know, in a strict quarantine on the other side of your destination, which is a really tough thing to do. You know, imagine landing somewhere or driving somewhere or taking the train somewhere and then not interacting with whomever you're actually going to see, getting a test there three days afterwards as well, um, and having both of those tests that I mentioned come back negative. That's the only way that this is even providing a modicum of safety uh, for people. And I just wanna point out that, um, that it still isn't a perfectly safe option. So I'll just repeat, you know, our clean and clear guidance is avoid travel over the holidays. Um, don't gather, it's to protect yourself, to protect the people whom you love the most. Yeah, and this just to build off of what the, um, uh, Commissioner Chokshi was saying, um, I'm actually in a very similar boat. And I, my mentality in life is if there's anything I can do to help, I want to do it. With COVID, if I can give you a free, free test, free hotel stay, anything in my power, I want to do to help you. With traveling, there's no easy answer. I have a young son, um, and uh, my young son also has not seen his grandparents in California in a year. And every year we go to California, never missed. But we're not going this year and it's hard my mom is devastated but um this it's not every year for the rest of our lives that we're gonna have to go through this but for this year there's too much at stake to take any risk um and that's why i've made the same decision that the commissioner has made um and unfortunately will not be seeing my family this year as soon as we have a vaccine and as soon as i can safely see my mom i my she would love to see my my little son of course but until then uh, keeping New York City safe is our priority, and the commissioner and I are both making some sacrifices in order to keep everybody um, on this call safe. Yes, and we'll, we'll be doing Thanksgiving via Zoom uh, in our household as well. Uh, we should point out that a negative uh, COVID test, uh, while reassuring, um, is, does, is not necessarily uh, a guarantee that you are not carrying the virus, partly because there can be false negative um, the, uh, more common with the very quick antigen tests, which are, are what people are lining up the city MD for, but also um, right after exposure, um, you may have already, uh, the virus might have already entered your system and you might not yet test positive. There could be a few days lag there. So um, just, just be careful no matter what. And if you do find yourself in, in some sort of gathering, uh, uh, open the windows, look for ventilation, keep your masks on inside, keep six feet distance inside. Um, uh, really, in, in any scenario, there are steps you can take to reduce the risk. Um, and, and please. And Councilmember Levine, can I, 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 that's a really important clarification. So I'm grateful that you uh, pointed that out. Um, to, uh, to recap, uh, a negative test, you know, is not a guarantee that you're not infected with the virus for the reasons that the council member has pointed out. Um, very importantly, it also means that you uh, cannot um, use a negative test to lower your uh, guard with respect to the measures that you should be taking in terms of distancing and wearing your mask. And something that is also related, and I, I think I saw a question about this in the chat box as well, if you have a positive antibody test, that should also not be construed as ironclad protection against the virus. So um, if you have a negative virus test, a positive antibody test, um, those uh, do not exempt you from uh, the things that we know prevent transmission, protect you as well as the people that you're surrounded by. Excellent point. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I have the antibodies, uh, even donated plasma. I still got to wear my mask. Uh, you, you don't have superpowers because you have a positive antibody test. Uh, uh, could, could you clarify uh, the, the time needed to required for quarantine if someone leaves the state and come, comes back or visits the state uh, and does a test result impact the amount of time that one needs to quarantine? Mm -hmm. I can take that. Please. So if it's a con one of the contiguous states um, adjacent to New York state, um, there's not that requirement. If it's a state that's not one of our contiguous states, then it's um, a 14 day quarantine when you come back. And the reason for the 14 days is that's the incubation period of the virus or 
um, the amount of time that it could take for the virus to start to grow in your body. It could be on day two, it could be on day 14. So if you're one of the people where it's going to happen on day 14, a negative test on day two does not predict what's going to happen to you on day 14. So that's why the quarantine is for 14 days. Now, that said, um, there is uh, an exception to this, um, which the governor has released. If you get tested before you uh, are coming back, um, and that's negative, and you get tested on day four after you're back in New York City, and that's negative, then you can be released from quarantine because that gives us enough information to know that you're extremely low risk for developing the virus um, in your body during the rest of that period. So there is an exception if you're willing to do those two things. And the contiguous states, thank you, thank you, Dr. Long, the contiguous states are not just New Jersey and Connecticut, right? I mean, are we counting Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania uh, as a contiguous state? Yeah, um, I it's five. Okay, so that would be Ohio as well then, okay. Uh, important clarification. Um, we, we have a number of questions about the relative safety or lack thereof of mass transit and subways. And it seems like our understanding of that risk has evolved some from the early days. Uh, it was a message of extreme caution, I think particularly because of fear that the virus transmitted easily by surfaces. But now we've seen from, from data around the world that there are are fewer documented cases of transmission on mass transit than we feared, um, with a big caveat, which is that if, as long as people are wearing masks, which is a, a huge uh, factor here. Um, can you offer any guidance about how people should think about subways and buses today? Well, you said it really well. Um, you know, the, uh, the evidence that we have from around the country and around the world indicates that mass transit is safer than we had believed, you know, earlier in the pandemic. Um, again, I'll just, you know, use my own personal experience. Uh, I continue to take uh, the subway myself. Um, my wife, who is a, a public school educator, um, also takes uh, the subway regularly. Um, but we still have to take uh, the actions that we take in any enclosed space, which is uh, to be very vigilant about keeping your mask on um, and trying to maintain as much distance as possible, uh, you know, which can be harder sometimes I recognize in a bus or a subway car, um, but is still important to lower the risk. So overall, um, it is okay to use mass transit, but, uh, but it becomes even more important to adhere to those health safeguards to keep it safe. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had some questions about childcare. Could, could you clarify whether given the school shutdown uh, this will impact child care. What's the status there? Um, the school shutdown does not uh, impact child care. Um, you know, child care is, uh, is something that is also regulated by, uh, by the state. Uh, and so at this moment in time, child care remains open. Okay, we appreciate that. Th there, there has been some excellent news in the last week about um, research on vaccines with two trials that are just going extremely well from Pfizer and Moderna, which are showing uh, really great results with 95% uh, or more protection um, and relatively uh, limited uh, safety concerns. Uh, that's great news. And it's leading a lot of New Yorkers to ask uh, when we might be seeing vaccines here in our city. Uh, could you give us any indication on the timeline um, and how they'll be distributed and, um, and, and how you determine uh, the prioritization for, for administration of vaccines? Sure, and I'll just start you know, by saying that, yes, this is, um, uh, this is a ray of hope amidst all of the challenges that we're confronting uh, right now. And um, you know, there are four uh, vaccines that are undergoing uh, tests in the United States. Uh, that are at a, an advanced level of, of uh, you know, going through the trials. Two of them, as you mentioned, um, which you may have read about, one is the Pfizer vaccine, the other one is the Moderna vaccine. We have seen some data from, you know, some of their findings, and the preliminary indications are, are um, very promising. Uh, you know, we always have to follow the science out, uh, you know, to make sure that what we think is uh, true about safety and effectiveness um, are actually borne out. 
uh, and the FDA will be doing a rigorous review of that. Um, and then that data will be made available to other independent scientists as well uh, to make sure that, um, that the vaccine is truly safe and effective. If it does clear all of those hurdles, which again, we're very hopeful about, it's possible that we will start to see um, both vaccines uh, available, but on a, a very limited basis starting in December. Um, and what do I mean by a limited basis? Specifically for healthcare workers who are at highest risk. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, there will be a limited supply available and it will be targeted to, you know, some of the people who are at greatest risk, our, our healthcare heroes. Um, so that's the very earliest that things could happen, again, for a very narrow slice of the population. Um, more likely for the general public uh, will be sometime in the spring of 2021. You know, I think March April uh, is a reasonable estimate. It may be a little bit sooner. It may be a little bit later than that. Um, but you know, again, if it clears all of the hurdles that I'm describing, uh, then that's the timeline that we should have in mind at this moment. One other thing that I'll emphasize on this, which is um, we have a safe, effective, life-saving vaccine today, and that's the flu vaccine. Um, so I want to make sure everyone knows uh, that they should get their flu shot if you haven't already. We have a simple goal at the health department to make this a historic year with respect to flu vaccination and over 1.5 million New Yorkers have already gotten their shots. It's so important to protect yourself as well as to protect the most vulnerable New Yorkers. So if you haven't gotten it yet, there's plenty of supply. You can go to nyc.gov flu. We have a map, uh, a flu locator, um, to figure out uh, the right place to get it. Uh, and the vaccine is, is free and safe, effective and life-saving as I mentioned. That, that, that is great news. And uh, I'm told there's been very low incidence of flu uh, in New York City this year, um, which is also good. I mean, that's happening uh, nationally and really globally. Just one more point on, on the, um, the vaccines uh, for, for COVID. Uh, Pfizer um, also shared this morning that for um, people in the study who are 65 and over, the vaccine was also extremely effective, 94%. That had been a major concern. That's great news for seniors who are most vulnerable. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, none of the, the, the two major trials that have been in the news this week um, have included uh, kids 12 and under. Uh, perhaps you can clarify that. And, and so that certainly leaves uh, a big piece of research outstanding. Is, is that accurate? That's exactly right. Um, you know, children are not included in the trials thus far. Uh, once we do have a safe and effective vaccine for adults, uh, I'm certain they will be included, but that will be in 2021. That will be next year. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is being tested on adolescents. So, um, you know, children above the age of 12. Uh, we haven't seen the specific data for that yet. So we need to follow the science there as well. Okay, good question on flu shots here, whether they're available at the places people are going to get their COVID tests. Would that depend on the site? It depends on the site, but in general, the answer is we make every effort to do so because it's so important to get your flu test when you're getting, uh, your, your, sorry, <laughs> your flu vaccine when you're getting your COVID test completely. But at, so I, I know that at the Department of Health sites, uh, I got to assume you can get your flu shot. So that would include the Riverside location on 100th Street and the Washington Heights location on 168. Uh, is, is that accurate? That's right. At almost all of our COVID express sites, I believe that's true. Um, I'll ask one of my staff to uh, double check me on that and put it in the chat box. But yes, we are offering them at uh, most of our COVID express sites. And with, with, with cases rising and the winter just starting, uh, we're all concerned about how bad this is going to get. And I think we're also worried about um, whether our hospitals are prepared, whether we have adequate supplies of PPE and ventilators uh, and, and critical medications. Um, could, could, you, could you talk about um, the questions of stockpiles and preparation um, as we look ahead to a tough few months? Sure, let me, let me start. And then, uh, you know, Dr. Long uh, is, is with our public hospital system and can speak, uh, you know, to health and hospitals preparations in particular. 
Um, but, uh, but all of our hospitals have uh, learned from uh, you know, the, the devastating first wave of the pandemic um, and really uh, poured you know, their hearts and energies into preparing for, um, for the second surge, which, you know, which we hope won't happen, but unfortunately, um, you know, we are at risk of given the numbers that we are seeing. Uh, so, you know, those preparations take a number of different dimensions, certainly with respect to PPE. Um, that was such a, a big concern uh, back in March and April. Um, you know, there is a, a requirement to have 90 days of personal protective equipment uh, stockpiled. Um, and that is true, you know, at both the hospital level and then there is a, a city backup uh, stockpile as well. That's uh, N95 masks, you know, that's uh, gloves that's gowns, all of the things, it's face shields, you know, all of the things that we know can protect um, our most important resource uh, if we do encounter that second surge, uh, which is our fellow, um, you know, clinicians, nurses, and doctors. Um, there's also other dimensions to the preparation, you know, making sure that uh, we're able to very rapidly expand if we need more ICU capacity, if we need to have uh, a very rapid deployment of ventilators. So all of those preparations are underway. That's great news. Um, so, uh, doctors, uh, we're, we're, we're worried about uh, what's ahead. And you see models and you talk to epidemiologists every day. Um, according to the state figures, uh, we're at about uh, 2,000 cases a day in the five boroughs. Um, and we were, uh, I guess, at uh, about 5,000 at the peak in the spring, not an apples to apples comparison by any means. Uh, but what, 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 what's ahead for us? How bad will this get um, according to what uh, experts are telling you? Yeah, well, we are concerned, you know, and I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna sugarcoat it in any way. Um, one of the differences for New York City compared to back in, in uh, March is that uh, all we have to do is um, unfortunately look around the rest of the country and see how this is playing out uh, in, in other states where we've seen you know, not just the cases shoot up, but also you know, hospitalizations and deaths follow that. So that is a big part of our concern, but this is not a foregone conclusion. You know, we uh, will do everything that we can uh, at the city and the state level to try to interrupt that spread. Uh, and then, it, you know, ultimately it will be up to all of us, um, not just with the actions that we personally take, but, you know, as I um, mentioned at the top, to make sure that our positive behaviors are more contagious than the virus itself. It's about taking that extra step, calling up someone whom you know, you know, may be uh, vulnerable and um, making sure that they're okay, making sure that they've gotten their flu shot, you know, making sure that they're taking the steps that they need to to protect themselves with respect to a mask and distancing. So we have to spread those things because we know that they work. That's how we kept the virus at bay over the summer. Um, we just have to maintain that discipline through these tough weeks ahead. Yes, yeah, so we're almost out of time, but I, I, I want to close on the optimistic observation that we've confronted this beast in New York City once before. And against a lot of predictions, we crushed the curve through incredible work by reg regular New Yorkers and so many of you who are on this right now. We have done this before. And as exhausted as we are, we're gonna have to rally again. We're gonna have to flatten this new curve. We have to start saying that. We know what to do because we've done it. And we are better prepared as a city, period. We have more treatments available. Our hospitals have learned so much about how to manage healthcare in the midst of a pandemic. And um, that's going to improve our odds. It's going to be tough. We don't have to sugarcoat that. Um, but I'm really confident we'll get through this. And, um, and we're gonna be here with you as long as it takes. This has been an excellent discussion. We are almost out of time and I feel we may have lost one or both of our guests. We did not get to all of your questions. Um, uh, great, you're still here, thank you. We did not get to all of your questions. I promise we will do this again. I promise you this will not be the last. Um, 
we're doing these in my office um, close to weekly with various guests. But um, if they'll be good enough, we'll certainly ask the commissioner and Dr. Long back again, um, as much as it takes to get through this crisis together. Um, thanks to the hundreds of you who joined us uh, here on Zoom and on Facebook. And um, Commissioner, it looks like we lost Dr. Long, but I'll just give you an opportunity to say some closing words. Um, well, no, I, I mostly just want to say thank you to you, um, Council Member. You've been uh, such a tremendous uh, advocate. I, I mean it, you know, from the bottom of my heart. Um, you know, you uh, have really helped us uh, spread the word, particularly at these critical junctures, and we're in one again. So, um, you know, to all of your constituents, uh, this is not something that is uh, is going to be solved by one person or two people or City Hall. This is going to take all of New York strong, you know, coming together once again. Uh, so I'm grateful to the uh, for the opportunity to share some of our thoughts and our resources. But I really, you know, invite you to um, to take up the mantle of this charge with us. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Long, and thanks to all of you who have joined us. Um, and we hope you all stay safe out there. Good night, everybody. Be well.